Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in our complimentary webinar series for U.S. federal government contractors. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. You probably found out about today's webinar through our newsletter, which reaches over 23,000 federal government contractors and service providers. Today's session is complimentary and also recorded. You can find the recording on our website and YouTube channel about 24 hours after the webinar, though usually even sooner. We have over 540 complimentary webinars on our YouTube channel. This includes all 52 parts of the FAR, all 52 parts of the DFARS, and hundreds of webinars on strategic and tactical topics. <coughs> Excuse me. And a little bit more about us. We are a specialized consulting firm focused on working with established federal contractors. We work with product, service, and software firms across the globe. For more information about our services, please visit our website and select About Us. As mentioned, today's webinar covering the FAR supplements is complimentary and recorded. We began this series in January 2022, and you can find these past recordings on our website, as well as the future schedule with registration links. Here's just a look at what we've covered so far in our Wednesday series. Um, we've already finished most of them, but we'll be winding down the series on August 24th with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And then on Fridays, we covered the same agency or department in a playbook series. The Friday webinars discuss upcoming bidding opportunities, contracting trends, small business resources, and sometimes, though oftentimes, feature a government speaker. The full schedule and past recordings are on our website under the playbook tab. And please note this fall, we will be starting a new webinar series covering subcontracting opportunities in the government departments. These webinars will be on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern and begin September 7th with the Department of Agriculture. You can find the registration links and full schedule on our website under the subcontracting tab. And we also have sponsorship opportunities available. And now we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors who, uh, who help make this webinar series possible. First, we'd like to thank the Virginia PTAC, the Virginia PTAC is based out of GMU in Fairfax and offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTACs can offer. And a special thanks to the Federal Business Council. The FBC creates and manages virtual and in-person meetings and events to connect industry and government thought leaders, product providers, and solutions with government programs that use them. The FBC works with a variety of federal agencies to connect government and industry in the form of in-person and virtual conferences, training events, policy dialogue, and outreach. Over the last 40 plus years, the FBC has become a comprehensive resource for connecting industry and the federal government. Next, we'd like to thank Dastin. Dastin is an IT and cloud solutions provider working with corporations, the military, and government agencies to lower their costs, increase scalability, improve operational efficiency, and meet compliance regulations using targeted cloud-based solutions. Dastin is a certified partner of Oracle NetSuite, a premier tier Google Cloud partner, and certified partner of Cisco, Virtue, AO Docs, and Authenticate. For more information about Dastin services or to schedule a complimentary consultation, please email Joe Alston or visit the Dastin website. Next, we'd like to thank C3. C3 ISIT develops tailor-made technology solutions that increase efficiency, bolster productivity, and improve business processes. C3 is the leading provider of managed IT services as well as compliant cybersecurity solutions for federal contractors. C3 works with defense contractors to achieve and maintain CMMC 2.0, DFARS, and NIST 800-171. Contact C3 to learn more about the CMMC 2.0 readiness program. The contact information is on your screen. Next, we'd like to thank RLJ Financial. 
Founded in 2008, RLJ Financial Consultants is a customer-focused, quality-driven, minority and locally-owned provider of commercial insurance brokerage services. Their services are designed to maximize your return on investment and managing the risk to your business. Call Roderick today at 202-832-1417 for a free consultation and insurance quote. And lastly, we'd like to thank the PubK Group. The PubK Group publishes news and insights for government contractors, agencies, and counsel. Every day, PubK delivers news on bid protests, contract disputes, new laws and regulations, cybersecurity requirements, false claims act activity, and developments in mergers and acquisitions in the GovCon community. In daily news briefs and in-depth conversations and podcasts and webinars, PubK leverages its deep bench of government contract experts to keep you up to date on the fast-changing government rules and expectations. And every January, PubK presents its week-long annual review, featuring more than 50 GovCon experts across a dozen panels, recapping the year's top developments. Participation and CLEs are free to subscribers. Visit PubK online at www.pubkgroup.com. All right, thank you again to our attendees and to our speaker for joining us today in our FAR Supplements series. Today, we are here to dig into the FAR Supplement on the Office of Personnel Management Life Insurance. So let's meet our speaker. Our speaker today is Tara Ward, and she represents the firm McDermott, Will & Emery. As a reminder, we don't take any questions. So if you have any questions for Tara, her contact information will be displayed um, at the end of the presentation, and you can contact her directly. So thank you, Tara, for joining us today. I'll put myself on mute and just let me know when you're ready for the next slide. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I suppose we could go to the next slide to perhaps tee up where we're headed today. All right, so uh, while we've got the agenda slide up, just a, a couple words about myself. I am a partner and the co-lead of the Government Contracts Group at McDermott. Um, I've spent almost 15 years in the industry at this point, advising all kinds of companies on all types of procurements, um, whether doing you know, risk analysis assessments or um, advising companies on compliance with the regulations or contract uh, requirements, and of course, litigation in, in several forms, bid protests, contract claims and disputes, and also you know, subcontract or prime type of disputes as well. Um, just at the outset, to set the stage for some of the background material and, and what, I, what I hope to do uh, here today, a, a quick little anecdote. Uh, one of my former mentors at the beginning of any project or in tackling any question raised by a client about particular requirements would always point to a sign on his desk that read, what does the contract say? Uh, and it's a great, it's always a great reminder to just, before we all get ahead of ourselves in tackling complex questions about some particular procurement, it's just to, to, to go back to basics, look at what the solicitation or the, what the contract says, and go from there. Uh, a corollary that I've, I've added, I like to think I added it, uh, to the what does the contract or solicitation say, is to go back to the regulations. What do the regulations say? Uh, and those are those can be tied together because you know if you're looking at a contract, you have the clauses at FAR 52 or the agency supplements uh, also in the 52 range. Um, but it can also be really helpful to go to truly go back to basics and look through the provisions um, that you know, aren't necessarily in the contract, but that guide the contract clauses, guide the procurements, and govern everything that happens under a particular agency's types of contracts. So with that in mind, I, I have to say I applaud Jennifer Schaus and Associates for putting on these, uh, these webinars, these supplement-specific webinars, uh, because they, they offer all of us an opportunity to dig into parts of the various supplements that we don't ordinarily look at, uh, to spend time with the provisions and not just the clauses, and to explore um, some of the agency's uh, procurement mechanisms that we don't see day-to-day. Uh, -day. So, uh, with that as you know, an introduction of, of myself and where we're where where I hope to go, um, you'll see here on the agenda slide. I'll talk briefly through some background material on the LIFAR itself, whether it's 
purpose, context, et cetera, um, before talking through some of, some of the definitions, key provisions, clauses, um, and we'll wrap up with uh, some, some high-level takeaways. Um, next slide, please. All right. So we're very obviously in the life art today. Um, what, what is the life art? What are we talking about? Um, as Madeline teed up at the outset, we're talking about the Office of Personnel Management um, life insurance procurement. So helpfully, if you dig into the very first parts of the supplement, um, the regulations outline the purpose. We see that the LIFAR is intended to and does implement and supplement the FAR specifically for acquisitions and administration of contracts for life insurance under the Federal Employees Group Life Insurance Program. Um, the FEGLI itself was established in, I believe, 1954. Uh, and for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it is the largest group life insurance program in the world and covers over 4 million federal employees and retirees, many of their family members, um, and it, it's essentially providing term life insurance. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, I, I pulled, as I mentioned when we did the agenda slide, I, I pulled some of the definitions out here, uh, not all of them, but just to give us a little bit of an orientation as we walk through some of the provisions. Uh, one of the themes you'll you'll hear, or I hopefully have woven throughout these these slides in this presentation today, uh, is sort of the similarities and differences where the LIFAR, you know, echoes and or departs from the FAR. And in setting forth these definitions, this is an area where we depart from the FAR a little bit, or we we tweak some of the terms that we think we know um, to suit the life insurance uh, industry. So, for example, uh, when we talk about contracts in the life art, um, we think we might all think that we know what we're talking about when we talk about contracts, but in this particular circumstance, we are talking about policy. Um, it, as you can see here, contract here means a policy or policies of group life and accidental death and dismemberment insurance. Um, contractors. Not necessarily, your, certainly not, not even not necessarily, certainly not your big, uh, you know, household names of defense contractors or IT support contractors. Here, contractors are insurance companies that are providing these benefits. Contract price, you might be, might be picking up on a theme here, means premium. Uh, we have specific, a specific type of contract at issue here. We'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about contract pricing. Um, but I've outlined the definition for the fixed price contract um, with limited cost redetermination plus fixed fee. The mouthful, I'm not sure any sort of acronym could make that easier, um, but we do see some similarities, some familiar, uh, familiar thoughts, principles here in dealing with fixed price contracts. We do have some cost elements and different ways of structuring the fee on top of that, but uh, if we're talking similarities, we are dealing with a fixed price contract here. Skipping down to the subcontractor definition, um, this is this should be familiar. This is any supplier, distributor, or vendor um, that's supporting a prime contractor under the FEGLI program. Um, but because we're in insurance, we do have to carve out uh, reinsurers, which is separately defined here to mean companies that reinsure portions of the total insurance. So again, just a, a stage setting slide to note some of the areas where um, you know, we might all know the lingo, but it takes on a different meaning when we're talking about you know, a federal agency such as OPM purchasing life insurance policies. Next slide, please. Okay, and the very first slide here, moving from definitions to actual substance. Uh, I, I just, I had to smile when I was going through the life bar to pull these slides together because the areas of difference are not subtle. Um, section in part 2105 and 2106, the life bar very specifically says FAR part five or FAR part six has no practical application here. And I just, I, I have to love that because in reviewing any other, many other supplements of FAR, um, we see minor revisions to uh, or additions to what is already in the FAR. Uh, we might see a sub subsection of some paragraph that might not apply. Uh, in the DOD context, we might see heaps of additional 
requirements um, tacked on to to deal with some of the national security interests or DOD specific concerns. Here in the life insurance context, there are plenty of places throughout the life FAR where the regulations just say, and I quote, this particular part of the FAR has no practical application here. So we do not have um, the, the usual publication requirements. The number, the, the type and number of vendors is um, set by statute. Who is eligible, who is not, that is not, um, that is not any exercise that the, the agency has to, to undertake itself. Um, contractors and their eligibility are set by statute. Uh, similarly, the competition requirements, we'll talk about this in a few slides, um, but this is not, like, in this life our provision of life insurance, we are not competing these opportunities broadly so that just any old company could submit a proposal. Um, again, there, there are statutory requirements in place here um, that, that, short, that offer a shortcut when we're in these types of procurements. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, a couple of specific provisions that, uh, you know, are, are just by nature different and um, tailored to this particular type of procurement. Um, part 2110 outlines specifications, standards, and other purchase descriptions uh, and some requirements of the contractor that, again, are consistent with some of the more typical insurance company requirements, um, but do have implications uh, when dealing specifically with the government. So under uh, subsection uh, 7002, contractor investment, you'll see here that the contractor, the, the insurance company, is required to invest and reinvest all program funds on hand uh, until they're needed to discharge their obligations. Um, under B here, you'll see that the contractor is required to credit income earned from that investment to the FEGLI program itself. This is probably not surprising given how credits and rebates work in the government contracts space, but just uh, it takes on a slightly different flavor in the, in the insurance realm. Uh, there is also a provision here, uh, significant events. Under this provision, the contractors are required to inform the agency of quote, all significant events. Separately, one of the contract clauses under the life bar defines a significant event to be any occurrence of, excuse me, I should say or, any occurrence or anticipated occurrence that might reasonably be expected to have a material effect on the contractor's ability to meet its obligations. Um, there are a number of enumerated um, examples, some listed here, so for example, uh, disposal of 25% or more of the contractor's asset, loss of 20% or more of its reinsurers, um, certainly termination or modification of the contract or subcontract. All of these things and, and more are significant events that the government wants to know about. So stepping back for just a minute here, uh, I mentioned one theme of this presentation involves kind of teasing out the similarities and differences with the FAR. The second theme today is noting where the life bar uh, really tracks the criticality of the services at issue here. So in this particular provision, you know, significant events, this, this makes, makes sense that the government wants to know immediately if there are any threats to the contractor's ability to provide life insurance benefits. That, that, that's really important. Uh, sure, in typical procurements for weapon systems, IT support, we as taxpayers want to make sure that taxpayer money is going to uh, to get the government the best value or however the procurement is structured. We want, we want the government to get the right goods and services for the right price. Just that's a blanket statement across all types of procurements with all types of agencies. Um, but you can certainly see all sorts of procurements and, uh, done by all different agencies where the particular goods or services are critical, whether for national security or um, other specific reasons. In this case, too, you know, the ultimate service that's being provided is life insurance, and that is really important. That affects real people. So um, you'll see here and in other slides a couple of areas where the life are and the requirements, uh, the sort of oversight flavor tracks with the importance of making sure that the contractor um, can provide those services or that the government is aware if there's any threat to the provision of, of those services. Okay, next slide, please. 
All right, so I promised we would come back to competition requirements in here too. I love this 2114, 2115. Uh, the FAR. FAR parts 14 and 15 largely just don't apply. Uh, so Fegley program is exempted from competitive bidding. Again, eligibility of, of the contractors is dictated by statute. On one hand, that, that makes sense. Again, we're, we, want, we have insurance companies. We don't have just any old company competing for these types of contracts. Uh, but on the other, this tends to be difficult for those of us in the, in the procurement space to swallow because competition is king. Right, SICA and competition, fair, um, full and open competition uh, governs <clears throat> everything we do, excuse me. <clears throat> but in this particular circumstance, that's not the case. So, what does apply? We do have a couple of provisions in 2115 that describe at a high level what contractors are required to do in order to participate, in, in order to contract with OPM for these services. So you'll see there 2115.370 requires insurance companies to demonstrate substantial compliance with certain requirements, including that they have stable management, they are able to market their services, and they have certain legal expertise. I couldn't go without noting this as a lawyer um, because this is, this is different, this is new and different um, for companies to actually have to demonstrate that they understand and can research, compile, comply with the web of federal and state laws that might affect benefits. Um, once you move beyond federal and go to the, the uh, framework of the state, the, the very different um, statutes, regulations, procedures, policies, et cetera, at the state level, uh, it, is, it gets even exponentially more complex. So to be able to demonstrate the ability to sort through that and comply with the different laws in place is, is really important for good reason. Uh, of course, internal controls, again, to, the, to my point on the last slide, that we're talking about really, really important benefits that affect individuals. Um, obviously, we, we want, we taxpayers, we the government, want these contractors to have the right types of internal controls. Now, on the contract pricing side, uh, I promised we would get here when we outlined the definitions of the types of, of contracts that are in, of, involved here. While the premiums are governed by statute, uh, there is a provision in the LIFAR that notes that contract pricing concerns, typically found in FAR subpart 15.4, are implemented here by applying the cost analysis policies and procedures. We'll see, we'll see more of that on the next couple of slides. But <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind, you'll recall from the definitions, we're dealing with fixed price contracts. There's also a fee involved. Uh, what is that fee? Well, 2115.4 states that contractors in this in, in this realm of life insurance contracts uh, will be compensated for risk assumed via an agreed upon risk charge, uh, and that is supposed to be paid when there is substantial risk. For example, when the balance in the employee's life insurance fund is no larger than five times annual terms. But the risk charge is not the only way to do this. Uh, the risk charge, as you can see here, may be waived in favor of a profit opportunity called service charge, which is determined by a weighted guidelines method. Uh, next slide, please. I won't walk through everything here, but I did want to just provide a visual of the weighted guidelines that are uh, outlined in the LIFAR. For those of you, uh, those of us that, that um, work in the DOD space and are, are used to weighted guidelines being um, being used to determine profit in the DOD procurement, uh, you'll note that some of these profit factors look familiar. We have some performance uh, metrics, risk metrics, capital investment met metrics, um, but they also are a little bit different. In this context, we have independent development, transitional services, um, other aspects that would be specific to the life insurance realm. The next slide, please. Uh, so, Diving a little bit deeper into the type of contract at issue here, like I said, fixed, at, at bottom, we've got fixed price contracts. We've got a premium that's agreed upon. Um, the statute sort of outlined the provisions for this, but um, basically the premium is going to be based on an estimate of the benefits and administrative costs plus a service or risk charge. The premium is determined annually. But on top of the fixed price, what do we do with some of the uncertainties of 
of related costs. Well, the life bar the life bar said, pardon me, Siri heard something in there and, and started talking. Um, the life bar said that claims costs exceeding premiums are going to be paid up to the amount in the fund. Uh, that that's certainly great for contractors, but as you might ex expect in the in the fixed price landscape, costs exceeding that amount are the responsibility of the contractor. So if I can go back to theme one, you know, one similar or at least familiar concept here is that we're talking about largely a fixed price contract where the risk of increased costs will fall on the contractor. Uh, and that's, that is the case here with the exception of, of some claim costs being absorbed thanks to the fund. On top of that amount, as we discussed, the fee, whether it's, it's structured as a risk or a service charge, will not vary with actual costs, but may be adjusted based on changes in the work. Next slide, please. All right. As we near the end here, I thought I had to throw in some of the provisions that do look a whole lot like what we're used to in the FAR. So there are a few of the basic labor policies borrowed from the FAR. Uh, Life FAR specifically states that 52.222-21, dash 22, dash 22, and 25 are implemented. Um, there are some minor revisions uh, there to make make sure that they're um, they, they're consistent with the statutory uh, requirements. Um, but perhaps of more interest, or, or um, I'll just say more interest, is that the contract cost principles and procedures that were hinted at when we talked about contract pricing a few slides ago uh, are spelled out in much more detail in 2131. The contracting officer is required to incorporate the cost principles and procedures of FAR Part 31. Uh, that's no small matter, as those of you who have worked in government contracting know, uh, the FAR Part 31 cost principles that govern allowability of costs and reimbursability of, of costs, discussing uh, reasonableness, allocability, and all sorts of um, specific costs that may or may not be allowable in certain circumstances. Those are incorporated here in the life arm. There are some selected costs that are familiar from FAR Part 31 that are specifically revised or, or dare I say tweaked here to fit the life insurance procurement mold. For example, I just I, I took a couple of examples. Uh, FAR 31205-6, which is compensation for personal services, is supplemented to note that in, in life insurance uh, contract cases, advanced approval of overtime is not required. That's a good example of a very specific uh, revision to what we what we all know and love from the FAR. Uh, similarly, but with some more complexities, FAR 31205-41 on taxes is parsed to uh, remove pieces of it, revise others, add uh, add a note that the portion of the contractor's income and the excess profit taxes allocated to family program uh, are going to be allowable. In addition to revising some of the selected costs, there are additional provisions related to major subcontractor service charges, reinsurer administrative expense costs that you wouldn't see if you were talking about insurance. Um, last but not least, you'll see I just identified the fact that there are there are specific contract clauses uh, in 52.70, which is you know you'd expect that based on the fact that the FAR and all supplements have contract clauses at 52. I didn't separately list them or go into them here because they largely just implement or, or echo the provisions that we've walked through, but uh, suffice it to say there, there are a few clauses that you would expect to see in, uh, in a life insurance contract. Next slide, please. All right, I think this is the last, last substantive slide I have. I, I did wanna highlight, uh, again, this is on the, this, this actually unites both themes. Um, the termination provisions at 2149 outline, as you'd expect, some T for D, T for C, default and convenience provision, um, but also include a, continu a continuation of services provision um, that I think speaks both to the criticality of the services, as I mentioned before, and where you see some um, departures or at least um, uh, maybe some augmentation of, of, of principles that we've seen in other, other supplements. So here in the life art, it specifically states the services under this contract are of vital interest to the government and must be continued without interruption in the event the contract is terminated. 
So there are all sorts of continuity of services requirements here um, that, again, if you're thinking about just to back up and out of the weeds of the regulations, we're talking about the provision of life insurance and the comfort and security that just having a policy can provide a person and their family. So the idea that uh, you, know, you need to provide notice of significant events that might affect your, your company's ability to perform, the financial um, capabilities, solvency, et cetera, uh, is, is one way to kind of get at ensuring the continued provision of services, even if you've got some sort of performance problem um, that you know, just happens. Um, but then on the, on the other side, if you actually have a termination event, there are, uh, there are mechanisms built in to make sure that you know, beneficiaries are not going to be harmed, or at least there's, there's some way of um, moving forward without threatening their, um, their access to these particular services. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I was right, that was my last slide. I do wanna just wrap up. I didn't have a specific slide for takeaways because I, I like to think that they were woven uh, throughout the, the, the presentation, both in my introduction and my introductory remarks on the importance of um, really making sure to take a look at not just the contract, not just the contract clauses, but also the, the provisions that pro provide the background, provide the reasons why we have specific clauses and the reasons the government might be approaching a, an issue or a problem in a particular way. Um, we've got the themes, both of the similarities and differences between the supplement and the, uh, the, the FAR, and we have the discussion of the criticality of services and the importance that you see throughout the life FAR in ensuring, you know, continued provision of these services. Um, I will just say, you know, the, the biggest takeaway of, apart from those things uh, would be, you know, if you are, at, wherever you are in the system, whether you're on the government side, you are an insurance company, you are a potential vendor or subcontractor uh, considering getting into this, uh, this area. It would be really important to, to line up the FAR, the LIFARs, to, to note where LIFAR uh, departs from the FAR to make sure that you understand some of the nuances. For example, that advance notice of overtime is not required. That, that, is, that might ease a burden that you might otherwise think that you have. Uh, so line those up next to each other. Um, if, if all else fails, go to the statute. Um, there, there are, the LIFAR is, is rife with citations to the underlying statute that govern um, everything about the LIFAR and these procurements. So, um, and it, short of that, of course, you can reach out to me with any questions because I, I appreciate that the interplay um, between FAR and supplements, and, and certainly LIFAR is no exception, can get uh, a little bit difficult, can get complex, you get in the weeds pretty quickly, and I'm, I'm always happy to be a resource. So with that, I, I think I spoke a mile a minute, but I really appreciate your tuning in for this. And I, again, thank Jennifer Schaus and Associates for inviting me here and for continuing to have these uh, complimentary webinar, uh, webinars available. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Tara, for a great presentation. Um, as she said, if you have any questions for her, her contact information is there on the screen. All right, and thank you to everyone who participated. The recording and slides from today's webinar will be available in about 24 hours or less. We look forward to seeing you on Friday as well as we go through the playbook for OPM life insurance. The registration links are on our website. So this concludes the webinar and have a great day.